my interest is in uh, nano superconductivity and astronomy. And those sound like a very strange topic together. What could nano have to do with the big things of astronomy? However, astronomy is always very much dependent on new technology that you can look better into the sky with more detail, with over a wider frequency range. I need to explain that because frequency range, we know the rainbow, we know that you have red and that you have blue and that you have orange and so on. That's part of the visible spectrum. Well, you can move out from that visible spectrum and then you can go to x-rays which are used to analyze your body and you can also go to lower frequencies as we call that infrared. That's what you feel when you feel the heat of the, of the, the furnace. And you can also go further down, you can go to microwaves, that's what is used in your cell phone. And you can use radio waves, which is used in your radio. Well, between microwaves and infrared, there is a particular area which we call far infrared. And that's a very important area of astronomy. And what is going on there is that the radiation which comes from the universe is absorbed by the atmosphere. So the atmosphere makes you blind for that frequency range. However, that frequency range is enormously important to get insight in how stars are formed, how galaxies are formed, and so on. So the question is, how can you actually penetrate that? Well, since the atmosphere is one thing on that list, it means you have to go to either in space or you have to go up to high mountains. And high mountains is sometimes good enough, but those mountains should also be in very remote areas. I mean, it should be high and dry. Well, that would be on Hawaii, it would be in Chile, or it would even be on the South Pole. The South Pole, that's what we call freeze dry. Those are beautiful places to do those measurements. Apart from these, you have to go in space. That's the alternative. Well, that's, that's conditions. And the next question is, how do you measure it? Well, to measure that, that is something that superconductivity comes in, and that's where nano comes in. Let's first speak about superconductivity. Superconductivity is a very strange phenomenon where you have electrons in a wire, which makes sure that you have electrical conduction in aluminum, in copper, or in any metal that you know of. And in the superconducting state, these electrons, they come together and they form a pair. Such a pair, that's called a Cooper pair, because of Mr. Cooper, who proposed that for the first time in 1956. Very important and very crucial. Then, if you imagine those are pairs, these pairs are bound together. They, there is an energy which pulls them together. Now, with the radiation from space, you can then absorb that by the superconductor and these electrons are then broken. And then you have free electrons again and you can measure that. You can measure free electrons and you can measure bound electrons. And that's the way you detect these astronomical signals. I mentioned superconductivity, which then led to the Cooper pairs in 1956. Well, that was a precursor of the real beautiful theory of 1957 made by Bardeen, Cooper and Schrieffer, three persons. And those are very important persons, in particular because Professor John Bardeen, he is the only person who has won two Nobel Prizes in the same field in physics. One for the invention of the transistor, the semiconductor transistor, and the other one for this particular theory of superconductivity. So he is a real hero. And I've met him personally, and he was, he was a very nice guy. At the same time also, he had a burning ambition in him, but he did, not, he did not show that very strongly, but he was very quiet. But as soon as there was some priority discussion, he would sort of burst out. But that's, that's an anecdote. And, but that's, that theory was the microscopic theory of superconductivity. And you have to recall that superconductivity as such that was discovered for the first time in 1911. So it took a very long time until there was a theory which explains that beautiful phenomenon. After that theory was available, people started to think about various ways they could use that, that, that superconducting phenomenon. 
And also there was something discovered which is called the tunnel effect, the superconducting tunnel effect. And that's where nano comes in. Because what is superconductive tunneling? You take one superconductor, which is then a block of metal that you have, and you take another superconductor. And these two superconductors, they look almost identical, but they differ in a certain way, which is, which is a very deep way. It's what we call the quantum mechanical phase. So it's like if you take a pencil on, a, on, its, on its tip, let's put it like that, and you allow it to fall and then it falls in one particular direction and you do not know in which direction it will fall. Well, if a metal becomes superconducting, it's like a pencil fallen in one direction. The other superconductor is fallen in another direction. So they are different. And then if you bring them together, they still can then interact and then they want to come into the same direction. And that is called the Josephson effect, invented by a young student, 22 years old, in Cambridge, in England. And that, that is a very deep phenomenon, also connected with the understanding of superconductivity. That was in 1962. Then people started to think, can we use that? Can we use that Josephson effect, that quantum mechanical tunneling effect? And in order to do that, you have to think about how this effect relates to radiation that falls on that particular Josephson junction. That has exploded in all kinds of directions. But then it took a very long time until a solution was found how to use that for astronomy. And the solution was found in 1978. And in essence, it meant that you needed to use quantum mechanical tunneling but the Josephson effect as such was only uh, making extra noise. So you had to take away that beautiful effect and to use one other signature of that quantum mechanical tunneling. And it, that is called photon assisted tunneling. So from 1978, photon assisted tunneling became the mechanism to study the radiation from space and from the universe. 1978, it's already a long time ago. But then you need to go further in the technology. You need to be able to make those devices to study that. And then you need to get a project which is ready to take it. So that led to a development which only ended around 1999 or something around that time. Then the technology was sufficiently mature to decide to go into space. And that, that was what I've been very strongly involved in. And it meant that the development of nanotechnology was needed together with a project management to get something into space. And the, the satellite that I speak about was launched in 2009 and it's called the Herschel Space Telescope. In that Herschel Space Telescope is an instrument. That instrument is based on these superconducting devices and it has been running for four years from 14th of May 2009 until the 29th of April 2013. Then the liquid helium, which was used to cool the devices, had run out. It was evaporated. So now that the telescope is still in space, there is no longer a helium liquid available to cool it. So if you would invent a particular way to travel to that satellite and refill it with helium, you would have a good instrument again. But now, since we cannot do that, it's just in a parking orbit and, and being there in outer space, waiting for someone who wants to use it again. So this, this Herschel Space Telescope has been very beautiful to, and to be used. However, uh, if you look more closely into the instruments, you find that, that there is only one pixel. It's only one sensing element which is looking at it. And as everybody knows who has a 
mobile phone or a cell phone, there, it has a multi-pixel camera in it. It's even a megapixel camera. So it's millions of pixels. So you would like to be able to do that as well for these astronomical instruments. And that's very difficult because it means normally that for each pixel you need to have four wires going to the device. If you have a million wires, you have to have four million wires going to that chip. Well, that's not very attractive because it means all these wires are coming from room temperature and then they go to helium temperature. So it means all the helium is bubbling and boiling and so on. So you don't want to have that. So you want to have two wires going to your chip. And that has been a major new proposal done in 2003 by colleagues of mine from Caltech, California Institute of Technology. They have proposed why don't you use something we call a superconducting resonator? So you, you, it's, it's like a swing, like a pendulum, but then from a superconductor. And then you take one line, and on this line you have various of these resonators. Each resonator has its own frequency. So it means that you have frequency one, then frequency two, frequency three, because they have just sort of different lengths. And that means if you take your line and you send then a frequency along this line and then you sweep the different frequency, you see this one popping, this one popping, this one popping. And therefore you can detect at which resonator the photons are arriving. That's what you're going to use. So what we are now working hard on is to use that idea, to use it into developing the most sensitive superconducting element you can get. And that's actually where our strength is, that we understand the superconductivity very deep and that we also want to go to the ultimate limit. And that usually leads that you have to analyze the physical limitations. And that's where our strength as a group is. And then we work together with the Space Research Institute in the Netherlands, which is then connected with the European Space Agency, and that's what we use to develop that. And currently we are now planning to measure a chip which has 26,000 pixels. And those 26,000 pixels will be used very soon in December 2013 in order to observe for the first time with multi-pixels the universe. And that's really our dream, and I'm looking forward to see that as a birthday present for myself.